Today's New Testament reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. Please hear the word of the Lord. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of man ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In all honesty, as I heard Sarah's excitement with the children's lessons, I was um, almost moved to... Uh, ask us to start over so she could let you know that she was giving a spoiler alert to the entire sermon. So, if for some reason that friendly nudge of a few minutes ago uh, just caused you to get more comfortable and you find yourself dozing off, don't worry. At the very heart of the message, you already heard it. As I was uh, sitting up here today, I was uh, reminded of my time as a kid growing up. I was uh, born in 75 So I was really, uh, my highlight of my kid years were the 80s. Um, Do y'all, any of y'all know what lazy boys are, right? Is that like a, okay. So um, when Mark came up, I was reminded of those times that I'd go visit um, a friend of mine and we'd be watching TV and he'd say, just sit anywhere. And that's what I'd do. And I'd sit down and, you know, I always choose the comfiest seat, which was usually a lazy boy if they had one, only to be there just long enough so that the dad could come in and just kind of leer over me and basically either say it or imply, that's my seat. So I'm thankful that Mark does not regard that seat as his seat. I'm thankful um, that he sees his job as a shepherd to sheep, myself being one of those. Um, Especially during this time, I appreciate his heart for understanding that truly the gospel message is ours to carry. Truly, the gospel message is at the heart of all of us who know Christ as Lord and Savior. So, um, if somebody's in your seat today in your living room, Dad, just let them sit there. Hopefully, they'll hear the word of the Lord and act accordingly. As we look at this text today, it's really pretty simple. Christ, the promised one, the Messiah, has come and is looking and is calling others to follow Him. You know, I think context whenever we read God's Word is always key. So I want to go through the first chapter of John's Gospel to get to where we are. In verses 1-18, through most of us will remember we are provided with a really clear, yet also very poetic weaving of the beginning of the Old Testament in Genesis and the beginning of Christ's earthly ministry on earth. Then in verses 19 through 28, we realize that John the Baptist, even though he says he is not, assumes almost an Old Testament prophetic role in paving the way for the Messiah. Then verses 29 through 34. Help us to understand that the Old Testament, the entirety of it, is fulfilled through Jesus in the New Testament. 
And in that, we learn that what was done and what had been done for generations by God's chosen people, although it did allow them temporarily to achieve forgiveness, restoration, redemption, and cleansing, is now going to be made available fully, completely, and eternally to everyone. By the time we hit verses 35 through 42, Jesus is calling the first of his disciples together. And throughout these parts of this first chapter of John's gospel, deep and powerful parallels are made and completed between creation and Christ, between the prophets and the one prophesied, between ritual cleansing from the outside and the ability to be cleansed from within, between physical birth and a new opportunity to be spiritually reborn in and through Christ. That's a lot to happen in 42 verses. Yet, the Gospel author John, the son of Zebedee, who's an apostle and a disciple and often referred to as the one who Jesus loved, continues to draw the reader in over and over and over and over again, helping us to understand that life was about to change for God's chosen people and for the entire world. Because you see, the Word became flesh and lived among us, And in Him, the past is tied with the present in order to make straight the way for the Lord. And through Him, forgiveness of sins is replaced with the forgiveness of sin through the Lamb of God, the very Son of God. And the chosen people to come would be His church, whose foundation is in Cephas, Peter, Simon, the rock, the son of John. And all through this, we, along with the original hearers, are left with a very concise and very clear understanding of who Jesus is, who Jesus was, and who Jesus will forever be. So by the time we get to our text for today, day four of this narrative, although much has been answered, we realize more is still to come. And to make sense of that more, I'm going to ask for a little bit of wiggle room with our text today. As we examine in these passages, I'm going to refer to three people. Jesus, Phil, and Nate. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want them to be approachable to us just as they were approachable to each other and to Christ. For simplicity's sake, Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God, the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Phil fills the follower, one of the first people God leads to Christ. And Nate, Nate is the newbie or the noob, one with lots of doubts, but lots of promise too. So we're going to jump into the text today. Sarah did a really good job of leading us in with enthusiasm, so we're going to see if we can ride that wave. And as we do so, let's start by opening our hearts to God in prayer. Father, please help us to be those who saturate our life with Your Word from the Bible. And Lord, as we do so, help us to give the Holy Spirit a vocabulary to personalize Your Word to us. Open our hearts and our minds and all of us to You, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And may we do it by, for, and through Your Son, the Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we have already seen in the brief overview of this first chapter of John's Gospel, action words or verbs for people in school, right? We just started school this week. Verbs indicate action are key. Let's listen to some of those that are used in these verses. Go, found, say, follow, come, see, ask, answer, call, reply, be, 
believe, tell, open. A pretty conclusive list for such a small amount of words. My hope is, as we study this text today, as we hear the movement in these words, that this passage will actually call each of us to move too. For people of faith in Christ must be those who are drawn into action. My real hope is that we are compelled and we are challenged to live out our faith just as Philip and Nathaniel did. Just as Phil and Nate did. So let's look at a couple of these words in detail. The first word we will focus on is found, which is used three times in verses 43 and 44. This word found literally means to discover, to find, or to come upon, specifically after seeking. In my own world, as I try to think about how to compare this, Hopefully in the next few months it'll be chilly enough we might grab a coat from our closet that we haven't seen since February. And we'll put it on and we'll instinctively put our hands in our pockets and we'll pull out like a $10 or $20 bill that's been crumpled up and lived there for nine or more months. That's really not what this is talking about. This is more talking about when somebody gives you money to give to somebody else. And in the process from one person to the other person, you can't find it. It's slightly more frantic. You're slightly more feverish. You have more intent to find that money. It's not a penny you came upon. It's something that was given to you for a purpose. The intent of Jesus finding Phil after searching for him is that kind of found. And really, the intention of Phil looking for Nate. Trying to see where he was because he was really excited about what was going on. Because you see, whenever you are found in such a way, you then are challenged in your own life to have a course of action. So when Phil is asked by Jesus to follow and Nate is asked by Phil to come and see, the finding leads us in to understand and help what those two words mean. You see, in this Scripture, follow brings about this context of moving behind someone in the same direction or or coming after them or going along with them. There's a particular emphasis in this word on accompanying someone who takes the lead and obeying them. It's not just walking behind someone. Likewise, the word combo come and see carry within the idea of arrival. Something that has become visible. The very act of knowing. In my world... There's a difference between mindlessly moving your car forward and stop and go traffic or coming across a beautiful horizon, sunset, or rainbow on your way home and what this is pointing at. The focus of these words is both on the action and the recipient of the action. So when Jesus finds Phil, it was as if He was communicating, Phil, it's, it's me, Jesus, and it is so good to meet you. I would really like you to be part of what I am doing, and I would love if you came and learned from me and did likewise. And then when Phil found Nate, his reaction was, Nate, I'm so, so glad I found you. You have to check this out. We have found the Messiah the, the one that has been prophesied and talked about for years, and I really think until you have firsthand experience of who He is, you cannot truly believe it. Together, these words of action really should cause us in our own lives to action as well. Because the triune God is the one who is always acting first for His good, thankfully, on our behalf. So when we read about God loving us first, when we see these very acts in the Bible from Genesis 
throughout the Scriptures of His mercy when we see the length to which He will offer forgiveness and atonement, we have to be drawn to act as well. You see, our best is directly related to Him moving in our following. I want to say that again. Our best is directly related to Him moving in our following as He leads. One of the significant realizations from my study with this text was a real high focus on relationship. For clarity, this is a known relationship. Not a I know of relationship. It's way more significant than that. At the very beginning of this Gospel, John is paving the way for us to have a much deeper, more personal, and for the people that heard it originally, previously unthinkable connection between holy God and each of them. Each person who puts their faith in Christ. N.T. Wright helped me understand that John's focus is to communicate that previous ways of having a relationship with God are now complete, fulfilled, and more personal than ever before through Christ. And as a result, our role as individuals is to realize and receive so that our own relationship with God can be perhaps what we never thought it could be before. And Scripture tells us that through Christ we are a royal priesthood. In salvation, our bodies become the very temples of the Holy Spirit. And in a way that had never been experienced before, we realize that we can live for Christ and be used by Him to help others come to faith and not die in vain. So brothers and sisters in the faith, don't forget how Christ found you. Be aware that Christ tells us to follow Him because Christ wants to use us to find others. And through that, we have the opportunity to see them join us and experience what it's like to be found and to follow Undoubtedly, if you're like me and you're not preaching this sermon, but you're hearing it, you might have a little anxiety. You might be overwhelmed with the concept of what it means to be used in the lives of your family and friends and neighbors to share Christ. And I get it. I'm not standing up here as one who is good at it. I'm standing up here with you as one who realizes that regardless of where we think we are, God is clear on where we should be. Perhaps it has never been easier in some ways to have that voice for those around us. Perhaps it's never been easier in some ways for grandparents to hop on Zoom and read Bible stories with grandkids. Perhaps it's never been easier for moms and dads who are finding themselves home more with their kids to be intentional about what it means to live for Christ and know Him personally. Perhaps for us, it simply starts with time devoted daily to asking God to lead us to who He is preparing the way for. So that would be the fills today. Nate's, here's the deal. We learn from this text that sometimes coming to follow Christ leads us to be somewhat skeptical. You might have questions, you might have doubts, you might think it's all a bunch of hooey. My invitation to you is to get a Bible, to go online and start reading one. Start reading the Gospel of John. And as questions come up, write them down. 
Find somebody in your own life who has decided to follow Christ and ask them. If that person doesn't exist for you, we do. Call our office. Send one of us an email. We might not know every answer, but we would love to have the opportunity to see you follow Him as well. Come and see. That's all we're asking you to do today. You see, we each have a role to play. Mind you, Jesus, as always, is playing His fully. He is always personally moving toward us. And as He leads us, we must do the same. So if you are out there and you do identify with Nate, there's a lot of unknown about what it means to be a Christian or who Jesus Christ is or maybe even who God is. I hope you consider this time right now for it could be the time when God has found you. It could be the time whenever you can start to hear the Lord's declaration asking you to follow Him. It might be the time that you can personally start to see who Jesus is and why we are best when we walk with Him, obey Him, and learn from Him. If you, like me, are Phil, you've been following Jesus for a pretty good number of years. I hope that today's Scripture reminds us that we also have a role to play. May we seek God and ask Him to lead us to who He wants us to find so that we can walk with them on their journey. We can merely say, come and see. In either case or any other case, our church is here for you. Our church staff wants to connect with you. It's different, but not impossible. We're here, and we can talk on the phone, and we can do a whole bunch of things. We can email, we can Zoom. We can help you in this time. Realize what it means to follow Him. I invite you to also look at our worship guide. We have a lot of ongoing Zoom discipleship groups that meet at all times. I've been in a lot of those, and I can tell you if you join one, wherever you are, you will hear the Word of God, and you will hear from people who in their own life have come and seen, who have decided to follow Him. Not lives of perfection, not lives of ease, but lives that have always been comforted by the fact that holy God loves them and they know Him personally. The great thing about Phil and Nate is that they both came to follow Christ. And the great thing for us is we can be just like them. Our best is directly related to Him moving in our following. And it all starts with Jesus. If we can, allow us to help you to know and experience that truth in your own life in more abundant ways than perhaps you ever have before. I invite you now to join me in prayer for our church family and others. Let us pray. Father, we are grateful today to be able to open Your Word and learn from it. Father, may the truth of it in clarity draw us closer to You. And Father, we think specifically of those in our church, family, community, and the world who we have a relationship with in one way or the other. For Louise and her family, Lord, we pray You would bring comfort. For Keith and his family, we pray you would bring healing. For Elizabeth, bring peace. For Karen, bring recovery. And Lord, continue to watch over Lois and her family. Father, we pray for our schools, our colleges, our universities. Specifically, Lord, for the teachers, staff, students, and families who are just getting this semester going. 
Lord, may this long weekend bring rest and a chance to reboot before the semester continues. Thank You for their faithfulness to educate, to look after their students and each other. Lord, we are reminded weekly of those who we have the opportunity to intercede before. For Melda, Risa, and Marilyn, for Ellen and Jane and Lib, for Emily, Frank, Elizabeth, and Theryl. Lord, for those that are serving our country, Ashley, Trinity, Brian, Seamus, Matt, Emily, and Dan, Lord, continue to protect them, continue to help them be earnest in what You have called them to do, dedicated and steadfast. Continue to help them realize that the freedom they fight for is truly found and truly made known because of our freedom in Christ. And Lord, for our first responders, for Nick, Joe, and Paul, and all the others who are on the front lines with COVID-19, keep them safe, keep them healthy, keep them well-rested. And Lord, for those who know You, continue Continue to use them in ways that they might not even see or imagine with their patience, Lord, to bring hope. Father, we thank You for the ability we have to join You in prayer for others. And we pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. Join us at First Presbyterian Church every Sunday on our website. Or watch us on My 11 Sunday mornings at 9.00.